Hello, welcome to the Fish in Lab of the Barcelona Research Community. Uh, <laughs> you want this in English or Spanish? Or... Raise your hand if you don't understand Spanish. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, actually, there was GPL and Qt PL and other things, and let's say it was GPL. And then in, in 2011, they added OS X, and I think they did the Windows support open as well. And then it wasn't until 4.0 that they clearly said everything is going to be open, everything is going to be GPL, and no more bullshit about licensing or things like that. And then, uh, three years later, Nokia buys Qt, which is like, what the fuck? It actually caught us by surprise, many of us who were in the, in the community already. And, well, to understand why Nokia bought Qt, we have to go back one year, which was when Apple released the iPhone. And the iPhone clearly changed how we understand smartphones, right? So we went from a smartphone where barely nobody wanted to write code in, to a smartphone where actually writing applications was their thing, and the ecosystem, based on the application ecosystem, was the thing you wanted to fall for, not really which operating system, whatever, or how to So, in 2006, which is one year before Apple releases the then, Protec releases a green phone, which is quite unknown in Europe, but in China they had um, moderate success. And the, the special thing about the green phone wasn't the interface, which was like symbian like so it's manual, up, down, bottom. But the interesting thing from, from the green phone was the technology. The green phone was running uh, Linux, and that is Linux, so no more symbian. Bullshit. And it was the API for writing code was cute, so it was really, really nice to write code. It was a, well, it is a pleasure, I guess, it's still these days to write code in comparison to what Nokia had at the age, which was Symbian. So in 2008, they decided to buy it, and of course, this changes the roadmap of Qt a little bit, right? Nokia used to do fonts, now they do something similar, and they needed Qt to be excellent on fonts. So they started to work a lot in the core of Qt, adding or checking, improving the performance of Qt Core and all of the other layers. And in 2009, they changed the license with Qt 4.2. They do LGBL, which this is a, this is a really interesting change. As some of you might know, the GPL allows you to, to use the software, but then you are forced by the license to release everything. So if you, if you would use Qt back in the days, your entire application would have been GPL or compatible. So proprietary applications that use Qt at the time, such as uh, Adobe something, or others. Uh, they had to go to Protect and buy license. That was a business model. In 2009, Nokia says, I don't really care of this license. I sell phones, I don't sell licenses, so I'm going to do it LGBL. They did not completely destroy the business model, but LGP already allows you to do proprietary applications with Q. So this was a huge, huge milestone for developers, and for many people adopted Q back then. There was this uh, GTK versus Qt, and one of the arguments for companies to use GTK was that they could do proprietary applications with it. So in 2009, that is destroyed. One of the changes, one of the first applications to adopt Qt was Nero. I think Nero, Nero, something like that. They were using GTK for the same reason because it was a thing they could use with a paid. And then they switched to, to Qt. But they are still switching to Qt. It was announced they would switch to Qt. I don't really know what they have. And last milestone, and with this, the story is more or less, well, the past is more or less over, is in 2011, which is when the Qt project is created. So the Qt project doesn't mean the Qt, like the code itself, but it means the organization around the project that provides, that creates the software. So, until this point, even when it was LGPL, contributing to Qt was a pain in the ass. If you wanted to send a patch, they will, but if you were really, 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 really lucky and you sacrificed some kind of animal to some kind of god and the stars were correctly aligned, they would take care of your badge and they would put it on the project. That happens sometimes, 
but it was really, really hard. And it was almost impossible to get your code in. And not only that, even if you got your code in, you had no say. There was no way of you deciding where you want the project to go. In the case of Nokia, a uh, uh, simple use case for this is Nokia was interested in making phones, right? But many other projects, we were interested in doing desktop applications. And we had no say. We just had to wait and see and sit down and wait for Nokia to do the right thing and take care of us. So in 2011, this changes, the Qt project is created. Qt project is a meritocracy based project. So you have the maintainers and you have a structure that is not that important, but the main thing is the more you do, the more you matter in the project and the more decision power you have. And we have really, really big examples of this. this is a, it's, it's really open. For example, the guy that, that maintains Qt Core, which is the most important part, the core, uh, it's Theo Masayla, he works for Intel. And the company that he narrated the core team, it's called Digia, and they don't maintain this part. Of course, they contribute, they send patches and everything, but the guy that decides if this Qt Core I don't know, growth or shrink, or if this cute core is a split or whatever, it's a Marcella who works on Intel. So it's, it clearly, clearly sees, uh, you can clearly see it as an open project. Another, well, you, you have maintainers of subsystems, subsystems or sub libraries that are from the community, that they don't work for any project. We have uh, John Lake maintaining the printing stuff, and he has a wonderful at kd.org. So he doesn't work, he does this in his free time. And this is up to the point where I think like latest statistics, 60% of code is still done by Digia, which was the all Nokia, all Trondek kind of. But 40% of the code already is done by other parties. So now it has become a really, really, really nice project to contribute. Up to the point where in KDE we have destroyed part of the things we had and we had to put our things back on Git. And I will talk about that. Okay, so that's about it, about history. Let's see, I can manage to go to the next one. Yay! So, what's the state of Qt? Uh, Qt is a project that is very, really hot, as you saw. And it has gone through all this history, going from a desktop focus toolkit to a mobile but mobile only for Nokia for this toolkit, only for Mingo, Symbians and friends. And what's the state right now? So well, for the desktop, it's perfectly awesome. If you want to write an application and you want the application to run on OS X, Windows and Linux, do it in Qt. That's it. There is no other, there, there is no discussion, in my opinion. With, with Qt, you can not only write your application once, and run it everywhere, and it's going to integrate, as we are going to see now. It also allows you to integrate further with the system. So in the case, you are really interested in some weird functionality of Windows, and that's, this functionality is not, it, it doesn't exist in any other system, you still can do it. It's native code, it's C, C++. So if you want to integrate with some weird menu of Windows 8, you can do it. There is no problem. So you can, you can, have, you can share 90% 90, 90 of your code if you want, and then have and then have one person of your code doing a deeper integration with each, with each platform. So it allows you to do everything. It allows you to share everything and to have, let's go to the case of VirtualBox. So VirtualBox, which is one of the most known virtualization solutions, because it's free and really it's free. The interface is done using Qt, so we can, have, we can see Qt in Windows XP, and, well, we can see the cursor is actually from the presentation. So you can see that the widget looks completely native, the scroll and everything, it's, it's rendered using the Windows engines to render things. So then if you would change the Windows theme to something more Vista-like, this will change and render Vista-like. And the same thing with Windows 7, 8 and whatnot. This is an application running on R6. One, well, if you use Mac, you would know that this toolbar on the top is a bit special and you don't have separation between button, buttons and things like that. Well, this is Qt integrates there as well. So those for the tabs in there, well, 
it fails to be integrated. And this one is in Ubuntu, Qt in Linux integrates with the two main platforms, so to say, KDE and Ubuntu slash GNOME slash everything G. So if you run it on on Unity, you get two versions that are integrated with it. Another big example is VLC. VLC is the most used video player in the world because it's free and it plays everything. And the interface is an Qt as well. So the same thing, we have the interface here in Windows this time, I guess. And yeah, yeah, this is an interesting case because in OS X it has a special integration with, with OS X. So even though they share 95% of the code, the VLC projects uh, consider that the OS X users need more or want more, demand more integration. So they added some special things that only work in OS X. This is one of the specific things. It is kind of menu in the launcher. This is only available, at least by people on Windows. So it doesn't make sense to do a cute class to do this everywhere, because you won't see this in KDE, for example. So in there, you have a Q Windows Extra, and in there, you can, I mean, you, you can have that piece of code not shared between platforms, because it doesn't make sense. This is something that you only want on Windows. Um, yeah, we arrive. If you have any question at any point, raise your hand, and we will make this more dynamic. But yeah, really, if you have any question or, or whatever, or you think I'm lying on something or whatever, raise your hand. So, for the phone, uh, yeah, the phone when Nokia decided to go the Microsoft way and go to the dark side of the force. They went to the dark side of the, fo of the force and they left us with a good technology called QML, which I will we'll talk more about it. But everything we had worked only on, on Mego, Symbian, and similar things. And actually, we had a guy, uh, Bogdan Valtra, I, I can't pronounce the name, but that guy by himself, in his spare time, decided to port Q1. So that was the first big port we had outside the Nokia world, which was Android. The integration in Android is fairly good. You have tools to deploy and it's fairly easy. There are a few quirks still and there are a few things you, for example in an Android, you want to, to make calls to the Google services and that's the services that allow you to do in-app purchases and things like that. Those are a bit tricky, but the rest is fairly good. You have, you have network, you have the whole queue things we are going to see now. You have uh, the toolkit kind of integrates already, etc. Then you have iOS. iOS is fairly good as well, but as you know, the people in, in Apple, they are a bit more picky with the things they accept in their store. So for example, they did not accept any, any other just-in-time compiler. So we have a JavaScript compiler, but for iOS, we cannot have it just in time. So it's a bit slower, which well, is slower, but it's okay because we don't, you usually don't write a lot of JavaScript with your application, so the bit of JavaScript you use, if it's not just in time, eh, it's okay. So yeah, it's really good as well. Windows RT is the latest thing, I think it's even better still. So it's still kind of experimental, but yeah, you can in Windows RT you can have two applications running at the same time, one with the main focus and one like, on the side, and all these kind of things you can already do with Qt on Windows RT. Plus it compiles, which, given that it's Windows on ARM, I think it's a achievement. So yeah, it's, we are going to show a, a demo afterwards, and you will see. Well, not, not, we are not going to show the demo on Windows because we don't have a Windows device. But the same demo you are going to see on Android and Linux and whatnot, it works on Windows RT. You believe us, we're going to YouTube and it's okay. And then you have Blackberry. Blackberry, the entire phone, we have a couple of here. The entire operating system is done in Qt. So as you may imagine, the integration of Qt is really good because well, everything is done in Qt. And Java and Ubuntu, which are entirely done in Qt as well, 
So everything is good, everything is nice, and everything integrates the best way possible. Yep. And uh, okay, this is this is actually is actually quite relevant in this. Um, everything now we are headed towards the internet of things, right? And writing code for the internet of things is a pain in the ass. Or it used to be. Because now the internet of things are starting to have a well, good, moderated good megahertz CPUs and RAM and even disk. So you can run Qt on it. And Qt supports, uh, well, Qt supports all the embedded platforms you may want to work with. QNX, QNX is what the BlackBerry phone is based on and is what most planes in the world in the intervening system have and is what you, what you probably have in your coffee machine and in your washing machine and in everything that is machine but it didn't use to be a computer. We have support there is official even though it's, also, it's not well, it's not maintained by this core group for by the community. But yeah, it's, the support is really nice. And it's so nice that the official -ish way of writing interfaces for QNX is Q. So when some manufacturer wants to build a small display in a refrigerator or something like that with QNX, the way the QNX has, it's a group of companies, I think, to do it is a cube, so it's, it's really, really good and well supported. Next one is uh, VX Works. I don't know any use case for this, but I know it's, it's really, really used on medical uh, things like a MRI machine and X ray machines. So the same thing. The super for this apparently is extremely good. I have never used it because, well, I don't do MRI machines for everything. And then you have Linux. You have within Linux many platforms that are supported, X11, Wella, and Frame Buffer. Which, well, you have many, many, many things here. You have the Raspberry Pi, you have microwaves, you have the Tesla company that, that does these electric, fancy electric cars. The whole dashboard is done with Q, which is a really good dashboard. This is what you see when you buy a, how much is it? $120,000 car? 50. Um, 50, okay, yeah. And what you get is a car with Q on it, which, well, if I had the money, I would completely buy one of this. Yeah, so like this, many different things. The Airbus, I think it was, now they are going to switch from QNX to Linux with Q. Okay, last thing. Why Qt is so out of the state? Now, for the developers in the room, let's talk why Qt is awesome for you. So, first thing we have is the system, which is this small tool right here. The system is nothing more than an application you can execute in your desktop, and it has indexed all the Qt documentation. So, instead of going to a site and looking for a search combo box, an input box that is never going to work, you have a system, you execute it offline, it's really fast because you don't depend on your connectivity. And it's in depth, so you look for any board and it will offer you a list of results. And, well, if, if you write Qt, this is one of the things that you fall in love with. And, well, the hipster programmers of Google Reds and other things, they are working towards something like this, but for all the APIs. So, yeah, it's been, we have been working with it for 20 years. It's really, 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 really nice. One of your closest friends on the other Then we have Qt Creator. Qt Creator is the ID for Qt. It's, of course, it's not the only way of doing Qt. You can do Qt with Emacs, Vim, and whatever tools you want. But this is what they offer you. And it's quite nice as long as you do Qt. You have, it's quite a smart ID. You have really easy deployment to different devices. So, for example, to deploy your Android, you put your Android, it recognizes it, next, 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 build on your Android. And it works, so you don't have to mess around with the command line and complicated stuff. And it has integrated a few interesting things, well, documentation and things of the like. So, yeah, and it's standalone, which is awesome for Windows analytics. 
when you need to install the Qt on Windows, you can download the Qt SDK, which is like a gigabyte worth of Qt, and you download next, 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 and you get the whole environment set up. Which is really nice when you are on Windows or OS X or some, of course, secondary platforms. Then it has a Qt ecosystem. Qt has been going for years and years and years, and as we are going to see afterwards, it's really, really nice to write. It's, it's a pleasure to write, and because it's a pleasure to write Qt, then you get many people doing things based on Qt. So we have the Qt frameworks. Qt frameworks is the outcome of 15 years or 17 years the Qt community has been doing Qt. So it's, it's kind of atoms, a lot of atoms in Qt. For example, you want to do a spell checking. And Qt doesn't have anything for that. We have something called Sonnet, and then you can plug Sonnet in your application, boom, you get spell checking. Uh, we have something like configuration on asteroids. We have libraries to detect your hardware. So if you're interested in all knowing the mount points of your system, or you're interested on making your system not go to sleep, like it happened a few seconds ago, and things like that, you can use Solid, which is the frameworks, and then there you go. And then you have many, many other things. Last again, which is not in the trend anymore, but it's still nice to have. And QCD is really nice. It's um, you can have it, it's a text editor, text pen editor widget, and it already it already comes with a lot of highlighting. So if you need for some reason to do yet another IDE in this wall, then you can use QCD and take it from there. It's really nice. In frameworks we have Kate as well, which allows you to do the same thing, but well, it has way more features than QCD. And then we have QTweet to do Twitter. If for some reason you want to tell Twitter what you are doing, you can use QTweet, QDropbox, and you'll find many, many other things. You have a wrapper for Spotify, you have a wrapper for even Mela, and many, many, many others. Soon enough, you're going to have one for Telegram. Spotify is actually cute, I think. The, yeah, but the library is not. Not the library, but the rest of client. The rest of client is cute. Um, yeah, and this new service called Telegram that is kicking WhatsApp us, I hope, is soon enough going to have a Telegram queue as well. So it's really, really nice. And since all of them are done using Qt, are, are done in the Qt way, shouldn't even need to look at the documentation. And with Qt Creator or Qt Developer or any smart ID, it's just hitting control space, control space, and combination. Okay, let's show a bit of, of code. I'm going to do a really, 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 really simple example. And I'm going to do it on Qt 4 and Qt 5. The reason why I'm going to do it in both is because many of those libraries I show, uh, they are still, even though they both they work in Qt 4 and Qt 5, which is the thing you should use, they have the syntax like Qt 4. So you might find a lot of code. Uh, actually, the, the biggest change in syntax is not in Qt itself, but this is in C++. We got this new standard of C++ 11, which is awesome and nice. Um, well, it, Qt makes use of it, Qt 5. So, yeah, you will find both syntaxes and um, you should get familiar with both. Oh, I've been willing to drink for a while. I'm going to show a simple, really, really, really simple example that is a TCP server that listens to a port, you connect to the port, and it shows whatever you write to the, to the socket, and it shows client connected, client is connected. And even though this is a really, really stupid example, take into account that Qt is already abstracting to you all the sockets for Windows, OS X, Symbian, iOS, Android, etc. Which is really, really nice especially given how fucked up sockets are in Linux. And you don't see anything of that. It also abstracts you the asynchronous of it. So in Unix, you can choose from Apple, Paul, and a few more. And Q does it for you, so you have to choose which polling system you use. In Windows, I don't really know what to use, but yeah, Q 
tight all of this one, which is really, really, really nice. And then you're going to see signals and slots, which is one of the core concepts of Qt. Um, yeah, that's basically it. With signals and slots and how to start your application, you can take it from the other one. Good weather today. We're trying to put some awesome highlighting. We are failing a bit, so we will use a very good highlighting, but not awesome. Hey. Uh, yeah, the name and that's it. As, uh, there is a. Um, well, okay, so this is. Can you? This is the main. This is how main looks like in simple class. In sorry, in Qt. So in Qt you have three applications types, and you have to choose from one of these. This is the first thing you do. You have the Q core application, you have the Q Y application, and you have the Q application. This is Qt five. I'm talking about. Q core application is something that doesn't have user interface, and the moment you try to do something with Qt that needs user interface, Qt will say, well, you don't have user interface. Uh, it's really nice for anything like a service or things like that. Qt Core, which is where Qt Core application is, is really, really small and thin. So when you think of Qt, don't think about this monster with UI, OpenGL, and whatnot. It's really well split, so if you need only Qt Core, it's, well, it's lightweight enough to be used on embedded and card and whatnot. So it's really on Raspberry Pi. It's really, really nice. And then what we do is we pass the arguments and we instance our class which is called discipline test and we call exec which is what executes the end loop and that's it. Let's go to discipline test. Let's go to the header. Okay, so this is how a queue object looks like. Queue object is the main object of queue. Most of the things are based on queue object if there is not a good reason for not being so yeah. and then yeah you have that macro called Q object. You don't want to go you, you don't want to know what is in there. But the moment you use the slots, which is this thing of over here, you need to call Q object. And this is mostly it. What we are doing is we are learning from the object and we are saying we have three slots. A slots is yeah, let's go this to this is this thing we're going to do. This is a Qt4 example, by the way. You will see it later in the changes. So, this is most like written in English. I'm going to do the, I would say, effort of reading through it. But it's really, really nice idea to that's it. So, Qt, give me a TCP server and start listening on any AP on the port 1987. And then Qt, the moment we got a new connection, please call to my slot new connection. This is what signals and slots are about. You have you can connect signals to other signals, you can connect connect signals to slots, you can connect other people's signals, like in this case, to your slots, you can connect other people's signals with your signals or with other people's signals. <laughs> so basically you can do any, any combination you want. You can you cannot connect a slot to a signal because that doesn't make sense. But besides that, that's so the moment a new connection happens, new connection is what is going to get called, which is this method over here. In here you call for the, you say, hey server, give me that pending connection to talk about. Tell me there's a new connection. Give me. It gives you a TCP socket. And then same thing. You connect to the disconnected side now, you connect to the ready read side now, and you connect to your two other results for that. This is really, really nice. Uh, I don't know if you have written any low level C code in Unix to do this, but the ready read is not trivial. And, well, Qt gives it for free, not only in Unix, but also in Windows. I, I have done a lot of networking on C, and I, that's why I really like to emphasize that this is really, really magic. And Qt is doing the right thing for you, so in Unix is doing it the best way possible. In Windows, I assume, <laughs> they are doing it in the best way possible. So it's, I should have added a screenshot of how this code in C looks like. It's really, really big. 
Anyway, so the moment that these bytes have been read, read, this is where we get called. We do some casting you don't really want to know about because the Qt file this is not needed. And you read all. And in this case, you show which client has this code. So in all of this, things do have to do account. In all of this, we don't need to take care of which peers have connected to us. In all of this, we don't have to take care of how long the message we have received is. You just call read all and he does it for you. You have read line as well, which will do the right thing and wait until a, a return thing character happens. Etc. Etc. Et so this is a lot about doing the right thing in all platforms, which is not easy job. Do you have this compiled? Not yet. Yeah, that's it. And Do you want to open the one in Qt4? Uh, whatever, it's the same. Qt4. Qt and this is the same thing all over and over and over. This is what Qt programming looks like. If you want to do a graphic user interface, you have a button, that's what I call Q push button usually, and you connect to the signal. Click. Click. Oh, that one was difficult. And then you put your slot. So, for example, something as simple as closing the application, the close is a slot. So you can connect your button with close and make the application close. I thought about doing that. Can you execute it? You have NetCat installed? Probably not. Or talent or something? We will see. Okay, so execute that. Yes, localhost 1987. And mm -hmm. with, with a space. Yeah. And then dash VVV. Out of this, yes. No, no, no. Hey, so if we go to that other tab, yeah, there is no good for this, right on. Hey, and now disconnect. From here? Yes, to here. Control C, C, and then switch. We can do this. Good. The example is really, really stupid, but I dare you to do this on C and tweak it in. What was that? Five lines of code and cross platform. Even some weird platforms like VX Works and Windows. Or Symbian. Or Symbian, but. Uh, well, but imagine this, when Nokia saw this, and then saw what the Symbian developers had to do with exactly this. I don't know who took the decision, but I'm sure he was like, she or she was like, oh fuck. <laughs> yeah, let's go to the Q5. So as I said, this thing will work on Bitcoin Q5, which is what you have to do, to use. But in Q5, we can use C++11 as well, which gives us a few things that makes our code better. This one? Uh, or the main one? The, the, the main one. So, this might be not the best C++ 11, in case there is an expert in the room, but at least this is what I thought was the most interesting thing. First change we see is in the connect. We are not using that signal and slot macros, which is really nice, because in the C++ 11 fashion, it will make your code will not compile if your slot doesn't exist or your sign doesn't exist. For Qt4, for a reason that you don't want to know, you could connect not existing signals to not existing slots and it would compile and yeah, it's kind of... We have had so many issues because of this. So it's nice if the compiler does a check for you and you don't require any random checks, that's awesome. And then the next awesome thing is this small auto that allows you not to have all the verbose in the queue. Sometimes have long classes, so you have to do QTCP socket, socket equals new QTCP socket to verbose, so you can use auto run. And then you have the best thing after the lice bread and the cheese, and, yeah, which is the little last. So you in here basically you say, hey socket, when there is something to read, call this small function, an animal function on the hand here. And yeah, with that, you save all that nonsense of slots and having one slot per each a small thing. In the case of disconnect, we don't really want to do something, just, we just want to print disconnect. 
or you want to delete some objects, something like that. Right? So instead of having another slot and making your code big and full of answers, just as correct and that's it. So there was one more slide? Uh, probably not because we're just quite late. Okay. But so sign up that property is this model. Ah, funny. But I, I, I can show a bit of QM. Okay. So that's about Qt and C. And desktop development with the things you have seen here. You can do all the desktop development you want for I don't know if it's important. Yes, for the phones you want to know QM, which is the thing my partner in Paul is going to show. Right. So yes, since we wanted to sh to talk about how to go everywhere without that uh, talking about QML was a good idea. Especially uh, QML is the technology that Nokia started to develop when they decided to go mobile. Uh, Qt had in place their Qt widgets uh, infrastructure, but it didn't uh, adapt properly to to uh, touch screens. Touch screens have some like more uh, interaction complexity than, than desktop. Desktop is very limited to the mouse and the keyboard. And actually one of the good things about the mouse and the keyboard themselves is that they require very little uh, interaction between those devices and, and the processor or the application. On the other hand, uh, touch screens are, and especially mobile devices, are all about having lots of sensors and Whatever you, you click, it's, um, it's, it's very, well, it generates lots of data. So they, they figured that they wanted something new, and they came up with this new language. Uh, let's see what it looks like. I am so good that I said I would write it here. Uh, a small example would be to show a small uh, rectangle that has a color. I, I hate those examples, but it's this example that everybody shows, and I, I cannot be less than the rest. Rectangle. Can you increase the font a little bit? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> you could have said that before. Maybe you would be more awake now. <laughs> so we make it red, the width is uh, 32, and the height is the width. Now we can try to run it. First, we have to save it, of course. So then, this end. It, yeah, C, B, C. So that's the thing. Uh, we get a rectangle that, where the width is the same as the height. It's not that fun, but here you, we can see a bit uh, what's the idea behind this. But first, it didn't work that well. But uh, yeah, the idea is that we have a bunch of properties and we have an object and we start to define things. The second nice thing about this is that here we're not, uh, it's, we're not uh, passing values. We are also passing expressions, so we could do things like plus 34 or head to 2 and it would still work, right? Uh, here uh, we have uh, JavaScript expressions and we can do anything that is supported by JavaScript. So to make uh, it a more interesting example, we can use quick quick controls. Quick quick controls is the, the thing we realized we needed once we did all the rectangles examples. We ran out of uh, we ran out of them, and then we said that's two interesting things. The the interesting thing about the could be controls is that uh, well it gives us things that can be used in an actual application, and we won't want to try, but instead we will have something useful. So there we get a button. Text equals all, and on click. Uh, parent dot color equals blue. So we get 
this thing here, and when we click it, it goes blue. Ooh, lighting, awesome, right? But I, I was telling you that this is to define user interfaces, and that QML is all about user interfaces. And here, so far, we're only seeing that we can do things. Uh, the initial uh, idea for this was that we would use anchoring for everything. So let's say we have another rectangle, for example, which color is yellow, and we can place it at in an absolute position like 45, 45 as well, and then we set it the name, which is like my rect. Not my rectum, just my rect. So here we get another rectangle, right? Let's say we want to have uh, the button, we want to have it in the middle of the rectangle. We can use the anchoring system. So we can do like place it in the center. Oh. oh, it's anchors. Yes. So now it's in the center. And the idea with this is that we can uh, start making it more complex and more complex by creating more of those components. How components are created here is just creating a new file. Uh, we can say that uh, the rectangle uh, will be a uh, reusable component. So we put it here. We always need to do the importing. In any case, what uh, the initial idea Nokia had was that, and it was not an idea they actually did so, was that they distributed a bunch of those components as their button there, they, there is view. Uh, both for the N9, but not both, uh, the N9, Viola, Ubuntu phone, and, and Blackberry are all of them uh, providing their, their native SDKs as, as QML components. So that's an area that has been very pleasant to explore. Uh, on, on the other hand, since what we as application developers are interested in is not to get our application tied to, an, to a platform but abstracting it out because we don't really mind the platform. What we are aiming for as a good project is to get this abstracted at least until to some, to some extent so that we can write an application on on Qt and QML, and then have it working on all the platforms like Android, iOS, and the like. So I don't know if there's any question, but I would like to stop here because I don't want it to get too late. Uh, we brought many devices that we can show you uh, that have some applications in Qt, so that you believe that everything we said is true. Because yeah, it's it's. It's the, the nice part. And if you have any questions, you can just ask. Sure. Yeah, um, I, I can understand when um, you made the you type the code here, and, um, but if you want to compile for Android, for example, um, this the, the file, the resulting file is um, it's ready to. Yes, what you will do, or the recommended way of doing it, because like in this world there's many ways of doing it, of course, 
the recommended way is that you get the Qt SDK that uh, where you will get a Qt creator copy. There, when you create a new project, you can tell, uh, I want this project for desktop, for Android, and for YOLO, for example. And whenever you build, you get like the three options you can choose. Like, now I'm building for Android, now I'm building for YOLO. And yeah, it does it internally magic. And how, how can you integrate this code with another one that you have in Android, for example, like it's net? Alright. Let me see if I have the Android as a documentation. I'm not sure about that. So you have this QGNI environment and QGNI object that you can use like to uh, invoke a Java object from Android. Uh, it's what we use, for example, for integrating the Qt applications with Android. What we use is this, this, this layer. On the other hand, the way we have for integrating, at least how we think an Qt Android applications would be, is that you write your logic in C++, you write your interface in either C++ or QML, and then you don't really need to use the Java, right? Uh, there is a need though, like if you want to use the Google Maps integration or you want to use well, any Android uh, framework that, that they're providing, the way we have to offer access to those APIs is through this layer, and this is, this is already happening. Like, for example, Google Maps integration is in the Qt location uh, module. Well, it's not yet in the, there yet, but it's created, it's on, on its way to get in, and, and we can do it. I don't know if that was your question. Yeah. Okay. But then let's go see the devices, uh, and if you have any question, you can ask me, Alex, or the other KD guys that are in the room, and they will very happily answer you. But I think we all also have beer, right, Martin? Yes. So, if you... We have a networking part of the showcase. So... Well, I, I think that I don't really have anything to show here. It's better if you... If they just come here and see it for the bar.